Well, good evening and welcome to, you know, welcome everybody to the Air Force Civilian Services AIM Higher webinar. For tonight's episode, Shoulder to Shoulder, we'll hear from Air Force veterans about their transition to civil service. I'm Bob Hall, and I work in marketing, public relations, and brand management for the Air Force Civilian Service. I work at Joint Base San Antonio Randolph Air Force Base in San Antonio, Texas. Just a little bit about me, I served in the Air Force for 28 years, the last 17 as a recruiter. After retiring, I taught special education in middle school before returning to the Air Force as a civilian. I've been a civilian employee for a little over three and a half years where I've worked as a recruiter and now in marketing, where in addition to these webinars, I help advertise open positions, where you, which you may find on afcivilliancareers.com. But it's not about me. So if you have any questions for us this evening, please ask them in the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. We have recruiters in the background helping to answer these questions, and we'll also work to answer your questions live throughout the evening. If you're new to learning about Air Force Civilian Service, I suggest you watch some of our most recent AIM Hire webinars at afcivilliancareers.com slash AIM Hire. They cover a lot of ground on what AFCS is and the essential role we play in sharpening the United States Air Force's Air Force and Space Force, you know, covering such things as the basics as, of working as a civilian in the Air Force and what that means for you and the specific career fields we support that you might be interested in. We also have episodes that cover answers to frequently asked questions and provide tips on how to improve your resume. Again, you'll find the entire library at afcivilliancareers.com. Tonight, I'm joined by our panelists, Unit Security Manager, Chris Mick, Drive Program Manager, Ken Journey, and Program Analyst, Jimmy Spears. Let's, we're just gonna dive right in though, but our first question is actually for the audience. We'd love to get to know a little bit about you. So the question is, do you have prior military experience? We'll give the poll just a few seconds here, a minute or so, whatever. Um, but wow, I'm seeing a lot in the chat box, a lot, a lot of prior service folks. Outstanding. So as you can see by the, by the results of the poll, 71% of you do have prior military service. And we're excited to have such a diverse makeup in the audience this evening. Um, thank you for all for joining you know, us this evening. And thank you to those that have served and thank you for your service from all the branches that I've seen uh, show up in the, in the chat box as well. So what I want to talk about first is, you know, a lot of people understand that you can apply for, an, for any variety of federal service opportunities, but there are a couple of special ways that you could be hired that we wanted to make sure that you're aware of. The first is the Veterans Recruitment Appointment or the VRA. You can be appointed under this authority at any grade level up to and including GS-11 or equivalent. Another uh, opportunity for you would be the Veterans Recruitment Appointment or VRA. I'm sorry, sorry about that. I meant the Veterans Employment Opportunity Act of 1998, sounded awfully familiar to me. But um, just so you know, the VOA, Okay, the Veterans Employment Opportunity Act is a competitive service appointment authority that can only be used when filling permanent competitive service positions. It allows veterans to apply to announcements that are open to status candidates, which typically includes current and former competitive service employees. All right, so there's, there's a couple things there. But I wanna ask another real, real quick pop quiz. I know it's, you know, the, the whole idea tonight is the, this is all about the audience. We're going to be able to talk and things like that, but it's about you. So it's time for a quick pop quiz, simple, true or false. Military experience is required to be qualified for a position with the Air Force Civilian Service. What do you think? True or false? Oh, I'm seeing multiple answers in the in the chat box and, and the poll is up. So we'll, we'll wait for the poll to come in. See, see where the majority lies. Let's see. Let's see what people are thinking. Drum roll, please. Oh, absolutely. A resounding answer of false at 
you know, 91, 92%. Um, and, and you guys, you know, for everybody to answer false, you're absolutely correct. Um, but this is the largest point of confusion that we see from prospective applicants. I just can't stress enough that military service is not required to be qualified for a civilian position with AFCS. There are some positions that may be set aside for certain demographics, such as spouses, veterans, um, those that qualify for Schedule A. Uh, and Schedule A just, you know, is it a hiring authority for people with a severe physical, psychological, or inter, uh, intellectual dis disability. Um, and those are, you know, kind of a set aside, if you want to call it that. But again, there is no military prior military requirement to become part of the Air Force Civilian Service. Um, and just so you know, you can you can subscribe to be notified of these positions. Again, on our website, you're going to hear me say it a lot, afcivilliancareers.com. Uh, and when you subscribe there, you'll receive the job announcements when these positions open in your area of interest or when those special occasion positions become available. So now. I've done my little thing. I've got you all involved, that kind of thing. But let's get started with introducing our guests. Chris, I'm going to ask you to introduce yourself to our audience first. Would you please tell the audience a little bit about your background and your current role? Sure. Thanks, Bob. Uh, my name's Chris Mick, and I'm currently the uh, security manager for the 502nd Communication Squadron, which is at Joint Base San Antonio Lackland. Though we have responsibility for all of Joint Base San Antonio. So we cover Lackland, Randolph, Fort Sam Houston, uh, and some satellite facilities even further out. Um, we have a squadron of about 460 people, largest communication squadron in the Air Force. And um, unique to the civilian service, uh, we only have about 80 military out of all those people. Everybody else is a civilian. So. Uh, makes it uh, a rather unique squadron. I spent 23 years in Air Force uh, security forces, doing a myriad uh, law enforcement flight chief. I ran a jail um, unit mobility officer um, and finally retired in 2000. Um, at that point, I went into the government contractor world, uh, which as a facility security officer, which is just the contractor's version of a security manager. And um, did that for 19 years um, with various companies here in San Antonio. At um, that point, about three years ago, I came on board with civilian, uh, civilian service, um, mainly uh, to grab some uh, stability um, as, as I'm looking uh, down the road here in a few years toward retirement. Well, great. And thank you. Thank you so much for sharing that. And, you know, you brought up a lot of great points and, and we might dig into some of those a little bit later. Um, but how about you, Ken? Tell us about your background and current position. I'll start with thanks for having me, Bob. I appreciate it. And I'm, I'm happy to take place in this shoulder to shoulder event. So my active duty time, I did just over 27 years active duty, retired as an E8, eight duty stations, the second half of which, same as you, uh, in Air Force Recruiting Service. Mm -hmm. uh, I retired in 2011, went to the private sector, worked for a 200 plus person ma chemical manufacturing plant where I was a training manager uh, for about four and a half years, um, commuted three hours round trip. Money was great, drive was terrible. <laughs> so uh, I, I got a hold of some folks uh, at Tinker Air Force Base in Oklahoma, and that's where I started my civilian uh, career in the Air Force Civilian Service. Uh, I've been in seven years now in Air Force Civilian Service. I started as an analyst uh, in a strategic planning where we look forward uh, for the unit and what we were going to do in the future. And then I went to logistics management uh, in an aerospace facility, depot facility, where we brought in new work for, for the depot to work on. Uh, and then now I'm a, a program management down here in San Antonio, Texas, uh, joint, joint base San Antonio Randolph. So i um, happy to be here. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much. I appreciate you sharing with us, Ken. And Jimmy, not that you're last for any specific reason. You just happen to be our final panelist. Um, so why don't you take a minute and tell us about your background and your role? Thanks, Bob. And again, thanks for having me. And, and uh, I'll go on and start with uh, military experience. I did about 24 years active duty Air Force. Um, over that career, 
I was in and out of aircraft maintenance in a variety of different uh, different functions. I also was a military training instructor uh, with the Smokey the Hair Bear Hat and that whole that whole business. Uh, did some time in recruiting and did some time in uh, normal sessions recruiting and did some time in health professions recruiting. Um, after retirement, I transitioned to uh, not civil service as much as straight civilian. Um, worked for a manufacturing company, uh, similar to Ken, a long drive. Um, they definitely got their money's worth. It was a lot of money and they got their money's worth. Um, it, it was good, um, but, but there was a lot of things that I missed uh, about, being part of the, about being part of the Air Force. Um, I retired again around 2010. Uh, got a couple of associate's degrees, uh, bachelor's in business, came back uh, to the Air Force uh, through civil service about four years ago, and I'm currently there now. I'm a, a MAPT lead. I'm an analyst. What that basically means is that I work in a maintenance depot, an aircraft maintenance depot, and I bring in new workloads uh, to support the warfighter ultimately um, and keep the, keep the depots in business. And that's me. Again, thanks for having me. Outstanding. Appreciate that, Jimmy. And, and thank you all. And, you know, thank you for your service. Um, we're glad you're here. We look forward to the audience getting to know you a little better over the next hour or so. Um, so here we go into the questions, what we're here for. Um, Chris, you know, as you mentioned in your introduction, you went to work in the private sector after retiring from the Air Force, and, and you spent quite a bit of time there in the civilian sector. Um, can you talk to us about your experience transitioning to the private sector and share with us what you brought back to civil service? Well, I, I was blessed in the point that I went to work as a government contractor. So you're still a portion of your job. You're, you're working with the military. Mm -hmm. um, Initially, I worked in a facility where it was all just civilian contractors, but eventually uh, worked in other facilities where you were side by side with people in uniform. Um, you know, you, you got to learn a little bit about each company's culture. That was that was probably the biggest uh, changeover because it was government contract work. We still had to follow the same government regulations as the Air Force relating to our programs. Oh. Um, so culture, some of the corporate uh, jargon, um, the benefits are a little different. Yeah. One of the big things was you had to decide what to wear each morning. When you leave the uniform, <laughs> you had the choice of green or blue. And, and now you actually had to have, uh, in my case, my wife advised me what to wear. <laughs> All right. Well, we'll give Laura credit for that. I happen to know Chris's wife, Laura, so we'll give her credit for that. So, so th thanks for sharing, Chris. Um, Jimmy, what about you? We won't, we won't save you for the last time. We'll, we'll jump right here after Chris. Um, what drew you back to the Air Force after years in the private sector? You know, I enjoyed the private sector and there's a lot of pluses, uh, but I honestly, I missed the camaraderie. I missed, I missed the, the connections that I had. Um, it was it was irreplaceable as, as much as there was in the civilian sector, uh, pure civilian sector, it, it, it really paled in comparison um, to the camaraderie within the within the Air Force. Um, I missed having a goal, a transparent goal that was communicated to everybody um, that was common. Um, and I missed, you know, kind of along those lines, I kind of missed everybody being united in, in the same mission while we all have different jobs. I know every morning when I wake up and I know every night when I go to bed that what I did through the day contributed to the, the defense of the nation, the defense of my kids. Um, and I miss that maybe more than anything else, just giving, giving some back. Yeah, that's awesome. And it's always great, you know, because for those of us that have served in the uniform, I, mean, I can't speak for everybody, obviously, but for a lot of the folks that I've talked to, you know, when you've served in uniform, you recognize that you're serving well beyond your personal needs. Um, it's, it's the much bigger picture. Um, so Ken, I didn't mean to leave you out. And so, and so I'm going to, I'm going to change the question on you though. Um, why don't you tell us how civil service is different than from serving in uniform? You know what? I'm going to, I'm going to approach that a little different way. I'm going to say it's, it's the same, but different. Um, okay. so when you, when you're dealing with, you know, in uniform versus civilian service, you still have, in my opinion, a more structured type work environment, then I'm not saying civilian sector doesn't have a structure because I've worked out there too. 
Uh, uh -huh. It just seems like, uh, you know, an echo in Jimmy's point, you know, camaraderie structure, you know, you're expected to, to come in a certain uniform, a specific image, present a certain specific image, whether you're uh, have a meeting, you're, you know, if you're, if you're not early, you're late. Um, those kind of things are still the same. And, and I know, you know, with 70% of the crowd out here uh, being pre previous military, I'm sure that they can relate to it. And, you know, after, after serving half of my life in the military, you know, you get to, you get to get used to those things. So in some way, in a lot of ways, it's the same, but in a lot of ways it's different. So, you know, you have a service commitment in active duty. You don't end civilian service. You can resign at any time. Granted, you're not going to get the retirement any further. Um, <laughs> So, you know, if you're told to deploy and, and act, you're going uh, as long as you have retainability. In civilian service, you have the option to deploy if you'd like to. Uh, there's something different. Um, in the military, if you have to work overtime, you work overtime. You don't get paid for it. Um, civilian service, you know, you get paid for your overtime. Either you get comp time or you get money. You can choose that uh, and however you're going to uh, get compensated for that. And to take that even further, a lot of civilian jobs now, um, offer 100% telework, which that's what I'm doing. I work 100% telework unless I have a meeting on either Lackland Air Force Base or Randolph Air Force, Air Force Base. Uh -huh. um, and, you know, or you can have a flex schedule. Maybe you work four tens and you're off Friday, or um, you work nine nines and you're off every other Friday. You know, it depends on what your unit allows, but a lot of times that's more, more opportunity. You have more opportunity when you're civilian. Uh, leave is a little different. Uh, you don't take a day off. You take you can take an hour at, at as low as increments is 15 minutes. Um, and if you take it over a weekend, you don't get charged for that weekend. You only use your leave on the duty days that you're off. So that's a big difference. It's a huge benefit. Uh, and another way it's the same is because you do have a retirement plan. You have the federal employee retirement plan uh, and you still have thrift savings plan investments. Um, so and then the last thing is that you have is a little bit more flexibility, you know, active duty, you can cross train, you can go special duty, you can do a lot of different things. You can PCS, put in for assignments. Uh, you can kind of do the same thing in civilian service, but you can take it a little bit further. You can cross train as long as you're qualified for it in your resume, you can jump from series to series to series into job to job to job, not necessarily in the same job series that you're in. As I stated earlier, I've been in three different series and I've only been in seven years and in two different yeah. locations. So there's a lot of flexibility. There's some similarities, but yet there's some differences. Over. Yeah, no, that that's great, Ken. And you provided a lot of really, really good information. Um, and like you said, you know, 70% of our audience is prior service. So they, they recognize exactly what you're saying. You know, they can relate to the, you know, if you're not early, you're late. And if, you know, if it's time to deploy, you know, you're told pack your bags, you're leaving in the morning if you get that much notice or whatever. So there's a lot of, a lot of good things there. Um, but Jimmy, I'm going to, I'm going to come back to you for just a second. Um, if Ken left you anything to talk about, no, just pick on you, Ken. Sorry about that. But no, it's some really great information, but you know, Jimmy, you and I have talked before and, so I'd like to know what similarities you've experienced between your time serving and your time as a civil service employee. I think, um, and, and I agree, Ken hit a lot of valid points. You know, my roll up to all of that is, and, and it's kind of me, but I think I, I, I probably share a lot, especially with the, the prior military, and especially if there's any of my maintenance brothers there, um, not to knock any other career fields, work-life balance was a challenge for me. Um, I, I was in missions uh -huh. and and I share that with, with my time in the civilian sector for the seven years, too. I was operations manager over there. Um, Work-life balance was a challenge. Um, civil service has, has given me some boundaries. Um, it's, it's, it's much more structured. Um, uh, similar to Ken talked about the hours. I've, I've got flex time. If I need to go in a little bit later, if I need to come in a little bit earlier, if I need to adjust my lunch, um, it's much easier to keep my family in the forefront and still do a great job um, without leaving my family in the dust. And again, I don't know that, that everybody shares that problem, but that was a huge problem for me that the civil service has really dialed in and been able to help me uh, through the structure and the, again, the different, uh, I, I don't have quite the telework that Ken does. I still do get, you know, a couple of days a week. Um, and, and just, there's a lot of, a lot of help there. Um, some of the other things, uh, Military, you know, there are a lot of stations uh, worldwide. We, for those of you who've been in the military, that's call it a dream sheet for good reason. Um, it, I feel like you've got a little more control in the civilian, uh, in civil service. Your choice of duty station, if you will, 
is, is nearly boundless. Um, I don't think until you start to look, you realize that, that you can barely throw a rock without hitting a civil service position across the nation. Um, and you've got a lot of control over it. Um, if you, know, you, you qualify or get qualified or get yourself qualified, um, and, and geographically as well as professionally, there's a lot of, a lot of opportunity for movement um, that, uh, again, wasn't always, uh, or at least I didn't perceive that it was always that way necessarily in my active duty time. Um, trying to think, that's, that's really, you know, the big one uh, that can, and I don't know that anybody focuses on it necessarily, but it is, you know, active as an enlistment, uh, civil service is strictly at will. Um, it's a choice. Yeah. We're all here because we want to be here. I meant day by day by day. We're, we're here because we want to be here. That's not, you know, I, I, I'm here for the next four years because um, everybody's there that wants to be. And so, you know, I, I think that that carries a, a lot of weight. It's almost like you bring everything that you really appreciated about uh, uh, your active duty time and, and you don't necessarily bring some of the baggage that you didn't appreciate so much. It's a little bit the best of both worlds over no that that's that's a great response and, and jimmy you talked about you know uh the moves and, and the locations and having control over that that assignment process if you will and, and ken's you know living proof of that so to speak you know because he came down from tinker you know in oklahoma and now he's here in san antonio uh at randolph but um you know when when i was a new civilian uh, i worked with several people that one one headed off to Japan, another one off to Germany, and you know they're they're getting promotions with the move. Um, and so not only did they get to pick a location overseas to serve a, a, as an Air Force civilian overseas, um, but the position also allowed them to get a promotion in the process. So those are some things that you know you're right. We don't necessarily see when we were in uniform. Um, we would you know we didn't have the pick so to speak you know uh, of where we were going to go next. Um, as you said, you know, we put in our assignment preference worksheet or commonly known as the dream sheet, because if you think you're going there, you must be dreaming. But <laughs> um, but but no, you're absolutely right, Jimmy. And, and I'm really glad you shared that uh, because a lot of people and, and tying it back to what Ken had said about changing your career field. You know, yeah, you have that option in the Air Force, but a lot of times your career field won't let you go. Um, because of Manning and things like that. But as an Air Force civilian, if, if your resume and, and your background says that I'm qualified for this new position, you get to apply. And everything that I've seen, everything that I've witnessed is your supervisors strongly support that career broadening and that opportunity to move on, whether it's to get a promotion or a new location or a new career series, a, a new career field. Uh, we call them a series. So no, great information, guys. And, and Chris, I see you sitting there out there in front of the mountains. Um, certainly wanted to, to bring you in, um, but I'm not going to necessarily ask you about the differences there. But what I am going to ask you is about any challenges that you may have come across in transitioning to civil service. Because like you said, you kind of worked right, you know, right next to as a, as a contractor. Um, what, what was that process like, if you will, um, transitioning over into civilian service? Well, I, I, the transition was, wasn't too bad. I, I got to be honest, having been out of the Air Force, active Air Force, uh, a lot of the acronyms had, had changed. Uh, so there was, a, there was a little bit of relearning, but, you know, the basics, the basics are all there. Uh, the hiring process, uh, all I would offer people is you got to be patient. There's some things you may have to do. Uh, your analysis, fingerprints, security clearance, depending on the job you're going into, uh, uh -huh. that you wouldn't necessarily have to do outside. And, and uh, here in San Antonio, we have lots of military installations. So things like fingerprints aren't an issue. But I'm going to give you an example. My daughter uh, was in civilian service and still in Army civilian service. And uh -huh. uh, she had to drive three hours to get her fingerprints. So wow. there, there may be some, uh, depending on what part of the country where you're at, some issues like that. But, but patience, uh, and and the you know the teams bringing you on will, will work with you and advise you how how to clear those hurdles. Yeah, no, and and you bring up a great point there, uh, Chris, that the team will help you clear those hurdles. You know, um, a lot of times. 
uh, again, you know, I can't speak for everybody. I mean, I can talk about a lot of the applicants that I talked to while I was serving as a recruiter, and a lot of them just felt lost. Um, that they didn't know the direction or what they were supposed to do next to, in, the, in the hiring process or the onboarding process when they got the position. What do I do next? What do I do next? Where do I go? What do I do? And, and so, you know, you talked about that, that, you know, your team's there to reach out and help you with that transition. And so that that's good to know. I appreciate that. Um, we did get a question from the audience. Um, just real quick, I want to, I'm going to throw this out there. Feel free. Anyone can answer it. Um, the question is, does the application process require a federal application or a resume? Well, I, I can tell you, I actually was hired off my resume. Uh -huh. I, I, I loaded my resume up to uh, the USA job site, and it was eventually pulled over by the civilian service personnel. Um, I, I have since completed the federal resume because as uh, several people a lot smarter than me have advised you can add a lot more information that a mm -hmm. civilian resume you'd limit yourself to that two pages and yeah and, and and Ken, I'm, I'm gonna, I'm actually gonna, I'm gonna ask you to expound on that a little bit because we've talked before, um, especially with your program um, about how the applicants get into the into the system and that kind of thing. And, and you've shared some great information, you know, offline, obviously, uh, about the difference between a resume and a federal application. So if you'd like to share that again for our audience, I think that it'd be appreciated. You bet. Um, <clears throat> so there's lots of tips that I can provide to try to help you get into Air Force Civilian Service. Um, so I run a program called Drive, Develop, Redistribute, Improve, Bolt, and Expose. So what I do is I take medically disqualified folks out of the United States Air Force, the Guard, the Reserves, and if, if they're unable to serve because of their medical disqualification but still have a desire to serve, then I put them in Air Force Civilian Service. I look for direct hiring authority, which means jobs that you don't compete for, and I use the resume. Uh, that they provide and or transcripts if they have them. So some of the advice I can give you is build a good resume. Uh, it's very different than the civilian sector. More is better. Um, don't just put statements. Quantify. Tell us what you did to get that skill or what did you did within that skill. You know, once you get a good resume built and your transcripts together and all your other documents, DD-214s, whatever, um, then you can start networking. Um, networking is big. Know what you're looking for. Know where you're looking at. Um, I can tell you that out of the small crew that's putting this event together, I've worked with four or beside at least four of you, uh, including Bob, including, including Jimmy, including Rodney. Uh, and then even uh, another story is uh, another person, Jessica here, used to work with my wife, civ civilian service, uh, years ago up in Tinker. So uh, small world, get to know the people around you uh, that can help you out and then know where you can go, airforcecivilioncareers.com, you know, USA Jobs, whatever. Get to know those things, look for advantages, uh, if you are a veteran, you know, use veteran VRA, as, as Bob mentioned earlier, uh, VEOA, is it, if you're disabled, use that. Whatever you got, maybe a Schedule A letter if you got something wrong medically um, that, that won't disqualify you from any kind of service. Um, so read the position description is another good one. Know what you're putting in for. And for each job that you look for, you're going to have certain KSAs, your knowledge, skills, and abilities required to perform that job. And you're going to have to be minimally qualified. So make sure your resume fits that job. Don't just copy and paste the KSAs, the, the knowledge, skills, and abilities in your resume. Like I said earlier, quantify for it. And then, uh, you know, just look around, be flexible, uh, because that's all you got to do is get your foot in the door and grow from there. Over. Uh, absolutely. And, and, and Again, you know, wealth of information here. And, and when Ken talks about, and, and Chris alluded to it as well, I, you know, that, you know, your resume speaks volumes. If you want to, if you want to say your resume could be your interview on paper. And, and one of the things that I found uh, as a recruiter is a lot of our job requirements are, you know, that you have the ability to communicate both orally and in writing. And so many people leave that off their resume um, because, well, I have a bachelor's degree, I have a master's degree, because when I call them up and I'll talk to them, they'll say, oh, well, yeah, but of course I can do that because I had to, I had to defend this or I had to do this, you know, in order to get my degree. 
and, but they never specified that they could communicate orally or in writing. And, and so I would suggest, in addition to, to what Ken is saying and what Chris is saying, um, is if, if it's in the KSAs, if it's in the knowledge, skills, and abilities, you know, use that, as Ken said, don't copy and paste it, but use it as a checklist. And when you see that I can communicate orally and in writing, go ahead and put it in there. Give an example of, you know, hey, I've demonstrated my ability to communicate well when I had to present to my commander or when I had to present to my troops, you know, if you were a former commander or a former leader. Um, so you don't want to just say, oh, well, I had the duty title of being a squadron commander or a first sergeant. So you have to believe that I can do these things. No, the resume will speak for you, but you need to tell us what it's supposed to say. Um, so that's that's kind of an important thing. And, and like I said, that was a common mistake that I saw, um, because if you're going through that checklist, if you want to call it that, the KSAs, and you have six out of seven, and you didn't talk about one of them, and somebody else talked about that one that you made that assumption for, that person that cleared all seven boxes is going to get a better look or a closer look than you will. So please, please, please do not self-eliminate because you didn't clarify on your resume. You got plenty of room to do it. You know, I've seen them up to nine and 10 pages long. So please feel free to do that. Um, and I, I've got a couple of questions that, that I'm going to ask, but before we open the floor uh, to that, I'd like each one of you to kind of go around and explain to the audience why they should join the Air Force Civilian Service. Um, Jimmy, we, we've left you be silent for a little bit, so let's bring you back into the fold. Uh, what would you tell us about why people should come to Air Force Civilian Service? You know, I hit some of it before, um, especially if you're coming from prior military. If you're not, it's uh, serving your nation and, and defending your nation is, is, is unprecedented. Those of you that have done it and miss it, it it's real quick to get back. Uh, you know, on the practical side, uh, don't want to get too political, but the economy is looking a little shaky right now. The blanket inside the gate is warm. It's cozy. It's cuddly. Um, and it can get cold on the outside, you know, in the times before I joined the military and the times uh, in between coming back to the civil service, I had opportunity to, to wonder from time to time, uh, you know, through downsizes and mergers and, and different things that take place. Uh, you know, what, what tomorrow's paycheck was going to look like and what my overall security looked like. And I think I mentioned that in one of the earlier questions. I, it, it is as clear as day to me. I know exactly where I'm at. I know exactly what my options are. You know, Ken yeah. mentioned networking. Uh, you can't help but do it. Uh, you, you just jump in, you take it with you. And it's, that security is, uh, is priceless. Um, it truly is priceless for peace of mind, especially you know, for those that, that are on the second half of their, you know, second careers or moving on mm -hmm. past, uh, it gets, I think, increasingly priceless. Um, it really, that's, that's about it. I, I will only caveat, not so much to the question, but a couple of these guys said that, that we know each other, a couple of experts when it, when it comes to talking about those resumes. So I don't want to switch back to that, but, <laughs> but a lot of good information was passed. I just want to give those to to those guys for the audience. Uh, don't, don't take any of that for granted. Reach out, ask for help. They gave you some tremendous tips. I am not the guy, but these guys, uh, when they're giving you those tips on those resumes and all that information that was passed, uh, Ken, these guys are magicians um, when it comes to, to pre presenting and, and, uh, and helping to, to convey what you need to do to get from point A to point B. So uh, back to that again, defense of a nation and and uh it's a great thing security a great thing and yeah. and that's over for me thank you no and, and i appreciate you sharing that jimmy you know um and, and you use the word network and i think i've heard it a couple times already this evening um just and i can't speak for the panel uh just you know for our audience i'm not speaking for the panel but you know networking is important so if you want to reach out through linkedin and, and send a connect request absolutely feel free to do that um, because networking isn't just you know who do i know that knows somebody necessarily it's who can i reach out to and, and so like i said i can't speak for the panelists i'll let them you know interject and say yeah go ahead and connect with me on linkedin um, but connect with me on LinkedIn if you have questions, if you if you want me to look at your resume, if you want our team to do that or something like that, or if you have questions about a position, um, because networking is important. You know, we can't, we're not the hiring managers, 
you know, I, none of us on the panel are hiring managers. We can't just give you a job, but we'll be more than happy to. I can, I'll be more than happy to do what I can to, to re help you reach your personal goals. So, you know, like we said, you know, we're talking about prior service members uh, typically and prior service, whether it's four years or 24 years, you're considered prior service and, and you're part of the family already. Um, so to become part of the Air Force family or come back to the Air Force family uh, may be a viable option. Um, so I'll get off my soapbox for just a little bit, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask Ken, uh, you know, to kind of answer that same question as to, you know, what would you tell the audience as to why they should be part of the Air Force Advanced Service? Camaraderie, um, simple as that. Um, like I said earlier, you know, I got into the civilian service because my wife was civilian service. She got into it years before I retired, and everywhere I went, um, she got priority placed. And she got to know some people and great people and they took care of her and they found out that her husband wanted to get into Air Force Civilian Service and sure enough, they took care of me. Um, so Jimmy and I worked together at uh, Tinker Air Force Base and then uh, here's the camaraderie again. You know, I remember you came up to teach my wife a class and, and we bumped shoulders up yeah. there. So it's good to see you again. And, you know, I'm, I'm running into common people down here. Uh, I was up there at Tinker and a good friend of mine, uh, well, my mentor from active duty, uh, asked me, he says, Hey, can you still want to come to Texas, come back to Texas? I said, maybe. So, uh, here I am, uh, running this program because somebody said, Hey, why don't you come down here and run this program? Uh, so, you know, I missed the family from active duty civilian sector was fine. Uh, but you just don't have it like you do in the air force, whether you're wearing the uniform or you're outside of the uniform, I just missed it. And it, you know, it's the team I have here is smaller than the one I had at Tinker, uh, still a great uh -huh. And that uh, super that previous mentor I told you about, he's my branch chief. He's my second life now. So uh, glad to be down here. Glad to be working for this team. Over. Yeah. yeah. No, thank you. And, and Chris, you know, what would you say? What would you know? Because you kind of kept your fingers. Like you said, you kept your fingers in the Department of Defense, you know, pretty much throughout. Um, but, you know, what would you tell the audience, you know, why they should be part of Air Force Civilian Service? So uh, along with the camaraderie. Um, that's definitely there. It, I, I would argue stability. While uh, I, I actually took a pay cut to come to civilian service, your, uh -huh. your benefits don't change when you change jobs. If you move to a different series or, you know, even potentially another service or another government agency, you still have uh -huh. your, your federal retirement. You still have your thrift savings. Um, in the in the private sector, your benefits uh, benefits literally changed every year. Um, one company I worked for, I know the the HR said it was about four thousand dollars per employee per year for benefits, and they were always looking how to shave that off. Everything's driven by the the profit and loss list. Mm -hmm. um, as a facility security officer, my job was overhead dollars. So if you weren't billing the contract. They were always looking how to shave, even though they had to have one because of clearances. Um, one company I was with, we had four, we did a, a merger of two divisions and we cut to two real quickly. Um, uh -huh. So, so and, and you have to follow the contract. Uh, even government contracts, government contracts are issued for a year at a time, usually with four option years. So you're pretty safe for five years, but then the, the next company gets it, that's the time they can weed out if they don't like you. Um, you may have to take some, a pay cut or a benefits change to stay on even in the, the same position. So the, the stability, um, the hours I, I'm brought, I, I, in the comm squadron, we get one day a week uh, teleworking if your job allows it, not all jobs right. allow it, obviously. Uh, we get three hours a week of uh, physical uh, PT, physical fitness, uh, that's billed as leave. Uh, for the extra hours I'm participating in this uh, seminar, I'm getting what they call premium hours, which are basically three free hours of leave uh, for, for yeah. working after hours. So stability would be my, my biggest. Uh, I'm sorry, Chris, when you were talking about getting, you know, getting the compensation time, the, the premium hours for doing this, we're getting paid to talk. What better <laughs> job do we well, have than this? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> so, but anyway, uh, I digress. I'm sorry. Um, and, and thank you guys. I really, really do appreciate each of you sharing, um, you know, the reasons that you look at why, you know, the Air Force Civilian Service is a good option. Um, I want to check in with our audience um, because I've seen some really good questions. Uh, I, I saw where Nathan uh, asked a question. He says he's been in education for the last eight years. Um, I did that uh, when, I, when I separated and then came, you know, when I retired and came back. Uh, but he says the amount and variety of jobs is overwhelming to me. Are there resources available to meet with a placement specialist or something else similar? And I, you know, I see some confused looks on your faces. You're kind of pondering. Um, if you don't mind, I can I can field this because um, one of the things, Nathan, and and I apologize if what didn't come from Nathan because this this certainly applies to everybody. Um, we don't have necessarily placement specialists within our department. Um, however, there are there are people to reach out to. Uh, the also. Uh, like I mentioned, you can you can connect with us on LinkedIn. Um, if you do a search on LinkedIn for Air Force Civilian Service um, and you look for those of us in talent management, uh, you, you, you know, we'll be happy to help out there. Um, but also keep your eyes and ears open to our in-person events uh, where you can sit down and you can talk to someone there as well, because our talent acquisition consultants are out at those. Um, so I hope that answers your question. Uh, and if not, you know, please feel free to add another question to the chat box or, or you know, like I say, contact uh, me through LinkedIn uh, offline and, and, we'll, and we'll make something happen for you. Um, I don't have a name for this, for this question, I'm sorry, uh, but someone asked, does a security clearance impact hiring decisions? Well, I, I guess I'll jump on that one for you, Bob. Uh, yes, it does, because every position has what's called a position sensitivity code that designates whether it needs a clearance, whether it needs a secret clearance, top secret, or potentially uh, SCI, which is intelligence community uh, information. So, uh, but not having one does not prevent you from applying or getting accepted. My, uh, my branch chief is the, the HR coordinator for the comp squadron. She white, writes initial waivers for security clearance all the time which means you can come on and, and work until you get that clearance. Mm -hmm. You know, basically uh, kind of a secondary offer almost that, you know, you got to get the clearance, but uh, right. it gives you the chance to work why it does. Some clearances, especially uh, you require a top secret, a uh, little more likely they're going to look for somebody that's previously had a clearance because they just take a long time. But, but each, yeah. each job, if, if you're not handling classified day to day, uh, the initial requirement can be waived. Okay, that's that's a great answer, Chris, and and I'm really glad that you fielded that because you obviously have the background in answering that and, and provided some really good information. Um, I know that yeah, the ability to obtain and maintain a clearance, you know, so um, it's not required initially. Uh, if you have it, great. But if not, don't hesitate. Again, don't self-eliminate from applying to a position um, because you don't currently hold one. Because um, as Chris pointed out, you know, initially, you know, there's a possibility to get that wave to put you to work um, and while that's being processed through. So, Bob, if I, if I could throw yeah, an alibi in there also, even though Absolutely. you've been in the service and had a clearance, if you haven't worked in a job that required a clearance in the last two years, they're going to make you redo your clearance anyway. Okay. No, that's, that's again, great information, Chris, um, because, you know, people get, you know, they do, they get confused about that and some, and, you know, I've talked to a lot of applicants over the years and some have that fear that, well, I can't apply because my, my clearance expired. Um, so with you answering that question right there, that that's that's great um, that they're aware. OK, it may be expired, but, you know, we can get started. And if it's been more than two years, then, you know, they'll they'll reinitiate. So so good. I appreciate that. Um, got another question from George King. He sa he says over my 24 years in the Air Force, I've had various jobs that had nothing to do with what I went to tech school for. In those jobs, I, I had to reinvent myself for the duties of that job. That skill that a lot of service members developed has helped a ton. How much weight does prior military service have when we don't have 
every qualification ticked off for a specific job. I'll jump in on that one, Bob. I'll say when you look at the knowledge, skills, and abilities for these jobs and you really dissect it, I'll bet if you look back at your 24 years is a long time to serve in the military. I'll bet you can find something that is very close to it, if not exactly what is in there. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sure you probably went through TAPS. Uh, I went through it twice before I retired. Um, they kind of help you transition your military skills into the civilian skills. And it's very much similar. And as you already ex experienced, when you, you know, when you come in the military, you don't have to know the job. We take, we train you to do the job or, <laughs> In your case, you had to learn different jobs because you didn't go to what you were taught to do. Um, but in civilian sector, you have to have some ability. You have to be minimally qualified. But I'll bet you if you dissect those knowledge, skills, and abilities, you're going to be and – and again, like I said earlier, if you study the job and you know what area you're going to, I'm never going to be an engineer. I'm not going to look for engineering jobs. But if you go into those areas and then dissect it, ask your friends, network, and – Figure out what you, if you need to fill a skill, figure out what you need to do to learn it. And that will help as well. Over. Yeah. And anyone else? Because I, I love to talk and, and I'll, you know, um, I know big surprise, right? Um, but, you know, but George, what I would say, like you said, you had to reinvent yourself for those duties. Think about the soft skills that you developed. Um, and like Ken just said, see where they're going to fit in. Um, to, to the position that you're looking for. Uh, clearly, you know, I'm not going to be a chemist. I'm not going to be a doctor, but I might be working in that facility because of the background, because of the soft skills that I bring. So I can't stress it enough. Don't self-eliminate, um, you know, if you feel that you're qualified. Just explain to us, try to put it as much as you can in your resume as to why you believe that you are qualified. Um, again, I can speak, you know, if I put my recruiter hat back on for just a second, is that as a recruiter, we'll take an hour or more to, you know, pull up a resume apart saying, okay, you know, George applied for this job. Why does he think he's qualified? And we'll pull it apart to try to find out why you believe that. And if we can see why you've applied, we'll call you up and say, Hey, let's, let's clarify. Let's make it easier for the hiring manager to see why you applied for this position. So again, don't self-eliminate, think about the skills that you have. And if you have that experience, it didn't have to be your job title. You know, um, and, and I'm actually going to let Chris, I'm going to I'm going to ask Chris to talk about that job title. Um, you know, you didn't have to have that job title to have those skills. So, Chris, I think you're a prime example of that. So why don't you share with us um, what I'm talking about here? Well, so so I, I mean, I'm a security manager in the uh, civilian hierarchy. That's a series 080 security specialist um, in the comm squadron though I was hired as a 2210, uh, which is an IT specialist um, with cybersecurity. Um, and this is where I would encourage you on the job site, uh, whichever job site, don't be scared of using the search function because search for things like security clearance or security manager. Uh, it was pointed out to me, actually, somebody took care of me and said, hey, I got this IT job over here that I, I wasn't looking for. And that kind of opened my eyes. Um, and uh, there's advantages to being a 2210 over an 080. Uh, eventually, at a certain promotion level, I, I'll, I'll have to jump to a 080, which we've already said is, is not hard to do as long as you have the skills. So... Uh, uh, yeah, it, it, it's there and the job may not be coded the way you, uh, you necessarily think it'll be. Exactly. I'll tag on to that a little bit too, Bob. And I think Please. it goes back to one of the compliments I gave earlier with the tip. Uh, you know, especially when you get into a federal resume, there's a lot of real estate there. You're not really bound. So I think that, that what you're asking or maybe painting as a potentially a negative can rapidly turn into a positive in that much like you said you know 24 years and and, and a lot of that times you didn't feel like that you were doing your specific job title or AFSC um, I don't know that 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 reality doesn't exist in a lot of places a lot of times organizations 
uh, you know, start to kind of dole out within. And, and they know that these hiring managers know that. Um, so sometimes even though you think, man, I'm not hitting exactly what this KSA asked for, um, as Bob said, paint it in there, paint the why. Um, because even, for example, if you don't hit that one, you may catch that hiring manager's attention to right. say, man, it, you know what, this is, this is my guy. Um, th this guy is, is, is a fit for, you know, I've got this other position and he needs to be multi-talented. He needs to be able to think on his feet. He needs to be able to move. He doesn't, he's not an in the box kind of guy. And yeah. so use that real estate, use that, those, those sheets to, to paint the picture and paint that thing as a positive. Um, and, and I think it'll work in your favor. Over. Yeah, no, you know, absolutely. Go ahead, Ken. I'm sorry. Put a bow on this, Bob. Um, so if you think about the three jobs I mentioned earlier, whether you spent four years, 24 years, or maybe even just high school, you've done it. I was an analyst. What do the analysts do? You, you analyze stuff and, and put out a report, whatever. Um, I was a logistics management. What is that? Basically, you figure out all the logistics of a project. You got this piece and that piece and this piece. That's all logistics management is. And program management, everybody's been a program management at one time or another. So, you know, a lot of civilian careers are that generic. And I bet you can put, you know, put your skill set inside of them. Over. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and it's so funny because, you know, I, I said that I served 28 years in the Air Force and uh, my first job in the Air Force, and this is kind of alluding to the job title thing. You know, my first job in the Air Force was electronic communications and cryptographic equipment system specialist. Holy cow. You know, that's, you know, nobody comes up with titles like that except the military, right? So don't look at the job title necessarily. Look at what the job duties are. And like Chris pointed out, do that keyword search for what you're interested in or where you feel your skills are located because the job title might throw you off. But you're like, hey, I'm a perfect fit for this. Just like Chris was a perfect fit to be the security manager under an IT information technology job title. OK, so can't stress it enough. Don't self-eliminate. And if you hit three out of six, guess what? You might be the only 50 percent person that's applying for that position. You know, everybody else is like a, a 10 or 15 percent or something like that. You might be the perfect fit. Or as Jimmy pointed out, they can see things that you because you've used that real estate, as he said, to explain why you think you're a fit for the position. And the hiring manager can say, absolutely. You know, Nathan's my guy. George is my guy. You know, Kathy's my girl, you know, whatever to fill those roles. So, you know, can't can't say it enough. Don't self-eliminate. Go out to afcivilliancareers.com, look at what the opportunities are, take advantage of it, connect with us on LinkedIn. Um, I say LinkedIn because that's the professional platform, um, you know, and, and just go through. Uh, I, I'm looking at the time and holy cow, we're like, you know, getting close here. Uh, final thoughts, questions, comments from the panelists, anything you'd like to, to throw in? Hey, Bob, I, I want to throw one more benefit that we didn't really talk about, but uh, Ken alluded you can move place to place. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, if, if you want to go overseas, you can actually get what's called return rights that guarantee you come back to your position in two or four years. Um, no, no other job's going to offer that. That's what. I'm really glad you shared that, Chris, because you're absolutely right. Uh, I talked about those folks that are now in Japan and Germany, and uh, that's that's one of the advantages that they're going to be taking advantage of, uh, one of the opportunities they're going to be taking advantage of uh, upon their return. So, yeah, absolutely. You know, the job security that Jimmy was talking about and, you know, the, the fact that I can, you know, travel around the world uh, on the Air Force's dime, basically, right? You know, the Air Force is going to pay you to do your job someplace else. Um, so that's, that's outstanding to do that. Um, you know, but yeah, here we are, like I said, holy cow, this hour went fast. Um, you guys have provided an insurmountable amount of information. Um, and I'm, I'm really hoping that our audience takes advantage of it, uh, because our goal is to help them reach their goal. You know, we all have jobs. That's why we're here, you know, but if they're looking for a position, I'm hoping that this helped them, you know, at least see that the Air Force Civilian Service is a viable option for them. Um, but I, I guess I have to say, you know, that's all the time that we have for today. Um, I want to thank everyone for joining us. And I hope you learn something more about the Air Force Civilian Service to help you transition to civil service, along with the amazing benefits that our panelists talked about. 
Um, and we offer those to every to every employee. It's not like, you know, Chris is allowed flex time, so therefore Jimmy's not, or, you know, Ken is allowed, you know, no. Um, the benefits are, are what they are, and we share them across the board. So, you know, we, we do offer those benefits that guys had talked about with that work-life balance and career uh, growth and progression opportunities, so, so much more. Um, I'm going to say it again, because if you didn't learn anything from this webinar, um, you know, to find our open positions, visit afcivilliancareers.com. Uh, you'll see an interactive map on there. I love that map because you can click on the location um, and you'll see every job that's available and you can, and those are links to go apply. Um, so I love that map for that. Um, but in addition to our job map there, um, you know, you'll, you'll just see a wealth of information, but you can also follow us on LinkedIn, on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. Um, if you're looking for us, you can find us. Um, and, you know, you can look for our updates, our news, announcements, and, you know, see what our team of nearly 170,000 civilians do to support our airmen. Um, and, and in closing, join us next month on Wednesday, uh, the first Wednesday of the month, uh, you know, for our next episode where we're going to be talking to some engineers and where they're going to share some of their achievements, technical, technological advancements uh, that they're working on. And that's, that's going to be pretty exciting too. So I hope you come back and join us there. Um, and so thank you again. Have a great night.